I'm going to do something that I, I've taught my small group to do. We don't give claps, we give snaps. So if we can give Pastor Mark some snaps this morning as he comes <laughs> up to share with us. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. Well, it sounds like at our church we have two favorite weeks of the year and they're being fought over right now, which is good. I think it's good that we fight over discipling our youth and our kids. Amen? It's a good thing to fight over. When uh, several years ago, when I was actually leading a youth camp, uh, we were, we had all the kids out and we were doing tug of war and we were, we did, you know, one with the guys and all the, we had this, I mean, this was a giant rope. I'm talking about like a 200 foot rope. All the guys on one, split them in half, all on one side, one on the other, and it was great. It was fun. And then we did it with the girls. And we had all the girls on one side and all the girls on the other, and big tug of war. And um, we obviously made it a little bit lopsided. And so uh, it, the, the game was over fairly quickly, and one of the girls who was on the team that was losing, she had kind of like wrapped the rope around her waist thinking, you know, if, I, if I'm the anchor then that'll be really great. But in the process of getting drug, she massively blew out her knee. Just, I mean, starts screaming, she's yelling, she's blown her knee out. It's, I mean, you could hear it, it was, it was a bad deal. And so um, we had some leaders that were heading off to get uh, like, you know, the nurse and find the nurse and what can we do. And um, as we were just kind of sitting there around her and I was trying to help her, just get situated, and there was a bunch of youth around us as well. We had been talking uh, the, during the morning session about Jesus as our healer. And so I just said, hey, let's pray for her healing. And so I asked several of the youth to just lay their hands on her and pray for her, and they started to pray for her, and you could actually hear her knee come back together, and she was instantly healed. Later that afternoon, I saw her playing basketball and swimming, and I was like, yep, she's healed. <laughs> The next day, uh, we were playing a game, and um, in the middle of the game, uh, a young young man in high school uh, completely dislocated his shoulder. It was a rough week of camp, just so you know. We (laughs) we play a lot of games and do a lot of fun stuff. He completely blows his shoulder out, and he's the same thing. He's in a lot of pain. We grab some kids, we get around him, and I'm right there with him, and we start praying for him, and you could actually hear his shoulder go back and socket, like... (laughs) And he was healed. Amazing stuff like that. Cheney Faith Center is part of the Foursquare denomination, and this year we are celebrating our 100th year as a denomination. Now, as denominations go, that's, that's fairly young. In 1923, a young lady named Amy Simple McPherson began the Foursquare Church in Los Angeles, and she was an evangelist and a healing person, and she talked about four things in her ministry that has stuck with our churches for these near 100 years. And so Foursquare stands for four specific things that we believe about Jesus. That Jesus is our Savior, Jesus is our healer, Jesus is our baptizer in the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is our soon coming King. On Easter, we celebrated Jesus as our Savior and risen Lord. Last week, we dove into the fact that Jesus is our soon coming King. And today, I want to look at some of the biblical truths that reveal that Jesus is our healer. I think this is important because I believe that Jesus still wants to heal today. And I wish he healed everyone all the time, but I believe that Jesus wants to heal us spiritually first and foremost, that out of that spiritual healing that you and I receive from the cross and the resurrection, that spiritual healing that is ours opens our lives to every kind of healing that we need, physical, mental, emotional, and any healing that is required for us while we still live here on earth so that we can have a thriving and powerful relationship with God and with others. And so today, I would like us to spend our time looking at some of the biblical truths about physical healing that Jesus has for us today. So let's pray, and then we'll jump in. 
Jesus, thanks for this morning. Thank you for an opportunity to study your word and to put our faith in you and to believe what you have for us today. Help us to understand this very challenging and difficult uh, topic, and I pray that you would quicken it to our hearts and minds. Help us to be people of faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'd like us to begin with a verse that I think should guide our conversation and our belief about physical healing, but maybe not just our belief about physical healing, but our belief about Jesus altogether. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, it's a very simple verse. It just says this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. We've been reading through the Gospels as a church, and I hope you have too, and one of the things that just continues to jump out at me and kind of leap off the page as I read is that Jesus healed a lot of people. That as you read that, that was a big part of who Jesus was when he was here on earth. He healed people. And Jesus 13.8 declares that Jesus is the same. He's the same yesterday when he was here. He's the same today, and he's the same forever. See, his character never changes. So in regards to physical healing, it means that Jesus healed in the past, and he wants to heal today, and he can heal in the future. So we have to kind of keep that in mind, not lose sight of this fact that when questions come, And when doubts come, and when someone's not being healed when we're praying, that this is what Jesus um, is calling for us to be. He wants to heal today, specifically with the cross and the resurrection, but there's also truth to that in regard to physical healing that we want to believe for. Now look with me at some of the biblical truths about physical healing. The first thing I want us to see is that Jesus' sacrifice and his atonement on the cross pays for our healing. It paid for our healing. In Luke 24, 44, Jesus is walking with two men right after the resurrection. He's walking to a city called Emmaus, and this is what Jesus says to them as they're walking along. He says to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So we know that Jesus fulfilled all of the law and the prophets and the Psalms. His sacrifice on the cross makes atonement for all of the law. And this is why we no longer need to obey all the specifics of the Old Testament law. We obey the spirit of the law because God's heart is still in the spirit of the law for mankind and the social laws that we have. But as far as fulfilling those things, Jesus fulfilled all those specific things on the cross. And that means that he fulfilled all of the blessings in the law and the prophets that were apportioned to us while we obey the law. And and he redeemed all the curses of the law that would fall upon people who didn't obey the law. Now, how does that relate to physical healing? Well, it relates to physical healing and the law and the prophets and to the cross in a significant way. Let me show you. In Leviticus chapter 14, and in other places as well, it talks about that when a person in the Old Testament needed healing, physical healing in particular, they could go to the priest and they could make a sacrifice or an atonement for their physical healing and God would heal them. Now that's an important concept because when we think about Jesus fulfilling the healing and restoring and fulfilling all of the law on the cross, that means that his sacrifice on the cross, his atonement on the cross, now becomes our healing today. That becomes part of our healing. We don't take an atonement or a sacrifice to a priest. We go straight to Jesus. Here's another example. In Numbers chapter 21, the Israelites were grumbling against God, and the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, and as they were bit, they began to die. And God had Moses make a bronze snake on a pole, and whoever would look at the snake on the pole, they would be physically healed, and you've probably seen that emblem. It's actually become an emblem of hospitals and doctors all around the world, the the 
you know, the icon of um, a snake on a pole. It might be one of the first graphics we've ever seen in the world, right? And Jesus is making a reference here in this moment in John chapter 3, verse 14 to 15, when Jesus is talking about healing and healing people, there's something interesting that Jesus says. Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So Jesus makes this very strong point and this reference to his death on the cross, that his death would be like this moment in the Old Testament where people looked at that snake on a pole and were physically healed. Jesus says, when you, when you look at me on the cross, as I'm raised up on the cross, that will be your physical healing as well. Now Jesus took it even a step further because he knew that we needed something even more important than physical healing right now on earth while we live here, he said you also need eternal life. So Jesus takes it even further and he says, not only will I be able to provide for your physical healing, but I also can provide for your eternal healing because I'm gonna die on the cross and it will fulfill all of the law and the prophets, all of the sacrificial law, all of the atonement law that allows you to be close with God the Father. So Jesus was dying for our spiritual and physical healing on the cross. And as Jesus says, as you look to me, the one who was nailed on the cross, you will receive healing healing. There are also two New Testament references about this idea as well that reveal Jesus' work on the cross as a provision for our physical healing. One of them is in Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. Now, Jesus does something very significant in this moment. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law, Paul says. Now, you may ask, what's the curse of the law? You mean there was a curse of the law? I, I didn't realize that. There was. See, in the Old Testament, there were blessings that were connected to the law, and there were curses that were connected to the law. There were blessings for living under the law, for obeying the law, and for obeying what God had called his people to do and how he called his people to live. And then there were also curses if you stopped obeying the law. Now, those were more like natural things because if you stop living under the protection of God, then naturally things happen in your life because you're not, you've, you've taken yourself out from under the protection of God in your life. And so one of the things that the Bible talks about in the Old Testament in several different occasions is the curse of the law. And that was, if, if God's people didn't obey the law, then the curse of the law would become a part of their life. And the curse of the law included sickness and disease and plagues and animals dying and all kinds of things, crops not growing well, all of these things were part of the curses of the law. And they would happen because they would take themselves out from underneath the protection of God. And so what Jesus is communicating here and what Paul is saying in Galatians chapter three is that when we believe in Jesus, we are redeemed. We're redeemed from the curse of the law because Jesus fulfilled the law. So none of the curse of the law is upon our lives at all. Not a bit of it. Because the shed blood of Jesus Christ covers us. It's now our protection. It's now our covering. It's also our healing. And so now under the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we have the healing that takes place in our life and that comes upon our lives and the things that um, can come upon our lives are just a part of being under the protection of God because we are his kids and we are his people. Let me give you an example. I once read a story about a missionary who um, was on and off the mission field over, over a, a span of about 25 to 30 years. And for about 25 to 30 years, he had this old car. And whenever he would come back to the United States, he'd drive this old car around. And it was kind of this kind of an old beater car. And um, he, he had had this car for about 25 years. And he decided I need to go get a tune-up on my car. I haven't done a tune-up in 25 years. I've been on the mission field for a long time. I should probably go get my car tuned up. And um, so he takes it to a mechanic and the mechanic uh, puts it, hooks it up to his machine 
and um, comes back out into the waiting room and says to the gentleman, um, what do you think is wrong with your car? And the guy says, I, I didn't really think anything was wrong with it. I just thought it might be time for me to do a tune-up. I haven't done a tune-up in 25 years. What do you think? And the guy says, well, according to my computer, nothing works on your car. He's like, well, what do you mean? He goes, nothing should work. It, no, I mean, it literally should not function or work at all. And the missionary said, well, I pray for my car every day, and the Lord's just taking care of it. And so the mechanic is like, oh, I don't understand that. What are you talking about? My computer says your car should not work. But when you're under the shed blood of Jesus, anything can happen, amen? I mean, God can do anything. And this is just a small example of that, that when, you, when we place ourselves under the protection of Jesus' blood and of the cross and the resurrection, man, Jesus just does whatever he wants to do in our lives. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 to 17, Jesus talks about this idea of the redemption and healing as well. It says, when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. Now, Jesus is talking about something interesting, and Matthew is trying to help us with this concept here in Matthew chapter 8, and he quotes Isaiah 53. Now, Isaiah 53 includes the most descriptive and complete prophetic words about the suffering the Messiah would do for mankind on the cross, but that he would come back to life and give us eternal life. So Matthew connects the idea of Jesus being our suffering servant on the cross with physical healing, with demon possession that was happening and demons being cast out and the sick being delivered and all of the sick being healed. He connects those two things. And what Matthew is saying is that the healing that Jesus was performing were, was a result of him being the Messiah that Isaiah had prophesied about. And so what we discover and what we see here is that all the blessings and prophecies that Jesus fulfilled on the cross are ours today, and that includes physical healing. So what we see is that Jesus' sacrifice and his atonement on the cross paid for our healing. One of the questions that many people often ask about Jesus is why? Why did Jesus heal people? And this is a good question. And I'd like us to try to answer it because I think it helps us believe several important things about Jesus. Some say it was because it was to demonstrate his power at that time, and then he doesn't really do that anymore. It was to reveal his deity and to initiate the preaching of the gospel. So we really needed it in the first century, but we really don't need it today. Now, those are all got good reasons, but there are several other reasons as well that we see that Jesus healed people, and I think they apply to us today as well. Let me give you several. The first one is that Jesus healed people because it reveals his heart. It reveals his heart for his people and for humanity. In Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, it it. Um, records this, this story between Jesus and the Pharisees, and he's trying to help them understand his heart. It says, One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. See, the point that Jesus is making is if my children are in need of something, I don't care that it's the Sabbath and you don't think I should do anything about it. My heart is to do something about it. And so Jesus is revealing that his heart is to heal. And since he hasn't changed, we believe that he wants to heal today. Jesus also healed people so God might be glorified. We see this in several occasions as well. Let me show you one in John chapter 11. 
In John chapter 11, verses 1 to 4, this is the moment where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead in a really interesting and and kind of powerful way that we'll talk about again a little bit later. But it says this, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. There are several times that a physical healing is done to glorify Jesus and reminds us why Jesus is so important in our lives. And John mentions here that Jesus loved Lazarus, and so he went to heal him. And I think the same is true today. Jesus loves us as well, and so he can heal us. Now, here's the interesting thing about this story and this concept as well, that God uh, might be glorified in a healing. Here's the challenging part. We notice that God can get glorified in a healing, but he can also get glorified when we don't get healed. That's the hard part. Let me give you an example. The Apostle Paul. In the Apostle Paul's life, he, he was praying for people to be healed. I mean, he was laying his hands on people and tons of people were getting healed. But scripture tells us that he had an ailment in his own life that never got healed. And he prayed for it all the time. And he constantly prayed for himself to be healed. And I'm sure he had other people pray for him to be healed. But at some point in his life, Paul worked it out with God because God told Paul, I'm not going to heal you of this. And the reason I'm not going to heal you of this is so that my grace will be sufficient in your life. So that you will understand my grace in a more powerful way than you ever possibly could have if I healed you. And so it's a very interesting concept here when we talk about God being glorified in healing because we also see moments in people's lives where they deal with an ailment, and because of their ailment, God is glorified even more. It's a very challenging concept, but it reminds us that Jesus does love us regardless. He can heal us today. We should continue to have faith and belief in that, but there will also be moments where God decides not to heal, and in that way and in that moment and in that person's life, God will be glorified even more as they talk about how Jesus carried them through a season of their life or God is carrying them now. It's a very interesting concept, but one that we have to continue to trust God in the middle of. Jesus also healed people because he had compassion on people. There are at least six references in the New Testament that talk about Jesus' compassion for people. One is in Matthew 14, 14. It says, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. There are five other references exactly like this one, where Jesus just had compassion on someone, and in the middle of that compassion, he healed someone. Now, the last reason Jesus healed is the reason that I believe we so often get hung up in our thoughts about physical healing. And so I'd like to take just a minute and talk about it as well. We see often that Jesus healed because of faith. It's a regular thing. It's used often. Jesus talked about it often. It's a part of the healing process. Jesus expresses this several times when he's healing people that your faith has healed you. Let me give you several examples. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 22, this is the woman who was healed. She had been bleeding for 12 years. And scripture tells us that she fought through a crowd because she believed that if she just touched the hem of Jesus' garment, she would be healed. So she did. She fought through the crowd. She fought through the crowd of people. And the moment she touched Jesus, she was healed. Now, Matthew chapter 9 records that Jesus felt in that moment immediately that that someone had been healed. But there was such a large crowd of people around him, he tried to look for that person. He even asked, who touched me? And one of the disciples said, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? There's people everywhere here. Everybody's touching you. What are you talking about? 
And Jesus says, no, somebody touched me and was healed. And she comes forward and she says, it's me. And Jesus turns to her in verse 22 and says, take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Because of her faith, she was healed in that moment. I want to tell you a story that happened just a month ago right here in this room at Cheney Faith Center. About a month ago, there was a women's event right here in this room, and a woman in our church was sharing with Kate that she had been having heavy heavy bleeding for about 14 days. And the woman said, I believe I'm supposed to ask for prayer for healing today. So Kate and uh, several other women gathered around her, and Kate had just watched, watched The Chosen about the woman who had gotten healed with bleeding, so that was part of a faith moment for her. Um, she gathered a couple ladies around, around this woman, and la- they laid their hands on her, and they prayed for her, and she was instantly healed. No more bleeding. It hasn't had any since then. So Jesus is still healing today, instantly, as they laid hands on her. So we're, we're seeing miracles happening right now, today, in our church because of the faith of people that are coming forward. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 through 10, this is that moment in Scripture where a centurion in Capernaum has a servant who is ill. And this, this centurion comes to Jesus out of faith and wants Jesus to heal his servant. And in verse five, it says this, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to, his following, to those following him, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. So Jesus connects faith to healing. He does that again in Matthew chapter 9, verse 27 to 30. It says, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling, have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him and he asked them, do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. Here again, they believed in Jesus. They had faith in Jesus and they were healed. On the flip side, on the flip side of faith, Jesus said something interesting when he went to his hometown of Nazareth. In Nazareth, he he couldn't do very many miracles because of their lack of faith. In Mark chapter 6, verse 4 to 6, it says, Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in in his own town, among his relatives and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Now, we don't want to be people that lack faith. We want to be people that believe Jesus for anything because nothing is impossible for God. Now, we don't ever want to tell somebody, you don't have enough faith to be healed. That's why you're not being healed. We don't ever want to say something like that either because that's an unhealthy biblical or even Pentecostal idea or phrase. We want to be healthy Pentecostals. Now, I've been asked many times throughout life as a pastor, why doesn't Jesus heal all the time when we pray today? I mean, why isn't he healing everyone all the time? And I think I have a really good answer for that. I don't know. I don't know. But I know that my heart is for Jesus to always heal. That's my heart. I know that that is supposed to be my stance. And I know that it's supposed to be our stance to have faith in Jesus to heal. Now, why he chooses to heal some and not to heal others, I don't know. 
I also know there are trillions of things happening every single day. And I don't know why God chooses to do them that way or another way. I'm not sure. I'm not positive. Do I understand why God is doing what he's doing all the time? No. But I do know that my response to God is that I'm not supposed to know everything. I'm just supposed to worship him. And I don't want my trust and I don't want my faith to diminish just because I see myself not getting healed or I don't see others not getting healed. I want to be very careful that I continue to trust God when I don't understand. And I'll be honest, there's been times in my life, if I'm going to be completely honest with you, that I've taken walks and I've yelled at God. I've screamed at God. I've gotten really angry at God about why he wouldn't heal a friend of mine or a family member. Kay went through eight months of a headache that was like eight or nine on the, on the pain scale. You don't think I was walking around my neighborhood yelling at God? What are you doing, Lord? What's going on here? How come you're not healing my wife? I've had those moments with God. And I've had those times where I've had to really struggle with this idea of faith and healing. But here's what I see scripturally. I don't want to be someone that loses my faith. And I don't want to be someone that stops trusting God because exactly what I want to see happen isn't happening. And so I just want you to know that I think this is a challenge. I think this is a challenge to our theology. It's also a challenge to our practical life. But I want us to continue to believe and to trust that God, when he wants to, in his infinite wisdom, can heal who he wants to, when he wants to. And here's what I do know. If we choose to take the approach that we're not going to have faith in Jesus, I'm fairly sure we will never see healing. I'm just sure of it in Scripture. But if we take the stance that we're going to believe for faith in healing, then Jesus can and he will. It's an opportunity. It's available to us. Even though there will be very hard times in our life where Jesus will not heal. And I don't know why. I wish I knew. I wish I had a great answer for you. I wish I had a sovereign answer and I wish I could tell you exactly God's will for every single person and exactly what he was speaking in that moment. But I don't know. I do know that I have seen those that have not been physically healed walk with Jesus and come out on the other end of cancer or something very difficult in a completely different situation with Jesus than they were before. With a much stronger and richer and deeper relationship with him than they had before. And while I would rather say, Jesus, couldn't it be better that they got that richer and deeper relationship in a different way? But I have to trust his sovereignty. I have to trust what God is doing. Here's what I've discovered. I don't think there's a formula here. You understand me? I don't think there's a formula for physical healing. Do A, B, and C, and you'll be healed. Get some oil, anoint them, and you'll be healed. Like scripture says that, and we're gonna do that, and we're gonna follow it, but I'm not sure that that's necessarily a formula. And here's why. There are also times in scripture where people didn't have any faith at all. It was the, healing was the furthest thing from their mind and they were still healed. Let me give you an example. The boy who was healed, from, raised from the dead in Nain, they're walking out in, in procession in the middle of a memorial procession, a funeral session. Nobody at all is thinking about this, this little boy being healed, but Jesus heals him. There's no faith involved at all, zero. Nobody's even thinking about him being raised from the dead. No one asked Jesus to raise him from the dead. Jesus just walks over and heals him. There's no faith involved at all. Martha, who we mentioned earlier, wasn't thinking about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead at all. When Jesus talks to Martha and says, Martha, do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? Martha says, absolutely. Absolutely, I believe that my brother is going to heaven. And she's not thinking about physical healing at all. It's not even a part of her thought process. It's not even a part of her faith. And Jesus says, I need you to understand I'm the resurrection and the life. And he walks over to the tomb and Lazarus comes out. So there are also these moments where People aren't even thinking about physical healing. Here's, here's what I'm saying. I don't think there's a formula. I've seen people that I thought had great faith in Jesus and not get healed. 
And I've seen people that didn't have any faith in Jesus get healed. So I cannot stand here and tell you, here's an exact formula about how people get physically healed. I don't think it works that way. By the way, I don't think we can conjure up healing from a sovereign God either. So we are in this process of saying, all we know to do is to put our faith in Jesus, to trust him in every single area of our life. And that includes physical healing. Now, I happen to know, and you understand this as well, that this happens to be one of those areas of our life that trusting and having faith in Jesus is difficult. It's challenging because sometimes someone gets healed and sometimes they don't. And so it becomes very challenging and emotional for us. And, and so it, it's very, it's very um, difficult to stand and walk in that place. Here's what I want us to do, though, moving forward as a church. I'd like us to be a church that believes by faith, that believes that Jesus can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and that if he wants to heal, he can heal. Yes. And that if he's choosing not to heal, then we'll trust him too, for whatever reason that might be, that we don't maybe understand or that we don't know, but we will continue to trust a sovereign God that we know loves us. Now, since we know that and since we acknowledge that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that physical healing was paid for on the cross and that it's clear that this is God's heart to heal, how should we proceed today? What are the practical ways that we see physical healing taking place in our lives today? And does scripture give us anything that we should do? I think it does. So let me just lay out a couple of those and talk about them in depth. There are a couple things that God's word tells us to do as we seek physical healing for ourselves or for others today. The first is in, well, two of them are in James chapter five, actually. The first one is ask the elders to pray for you. So ask the leaders of the church to pray for you. In James chapter five, verse 14 to 15, it says, is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. Another one is ask another believer to pray for you. In James chapter five, verse 16, the very next verse, it says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So we're supposed to be praying together. And when we pray together, our sins are forgiven and we can also see physical healing take place. It can happen whenever we pray together. Another one is to lay hands on the sick and pray for them. In Luke chapter four, verse 40, it says, at sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Now, one of the things that we say a lot, right? What would Jesus do? Well, should we probably just do what Jesus did? Yeah, let's do what Jesus did. Well, what did Jesus do? Well, he laid hands on people. He prayed for them to be healed and they were. Now, I wish that every single person we laid hands on was healed. That's not always the case. But that doesn't mean that it's not something we should continue to do over and over again out of faith and belief. And so we will. We will lay hands on the sick and we will pray for them. Another thing we can do is we can seek out someone who has the gift of healing to pray for you. When you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and it lays out what the church is going to be like and what, how you and I are supposed to operate as a body of Christ, it talks about the gift of healing. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 27 to 28, it says, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. One of the gifts that 1 Corinthians 12 says is, is in operation in the body of Christ is the gift of healing. So there's people in our church that have what would be called the gift of healing. And so when somebody needs healing, it makes sense for us to seek out that person who has the gift of healing and have them pray for, for people that need healing. Now, if you're that person that has the gift of healing, then it makes sense for you to start praying for people for healing. 
If we know who that person is, then it makes sense that we allow them to operate in their gift in the same way that we would say, if somebody has the gift of prophecy, we should let them prophesy. If they have the gift of teaching, we should let them teach. If they have the gift of helping, we should let them help. And so in this way, we see the gift of healing operating in the body of Christ because the Holy Spirit is among us. When Jesus died on the cross and came back to life, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of us when we believed in Jesus. And because the Holy Spirit is here and he's in us and working through us, then that means the, who Jesus is and the healing of Jesus is in operation in our churches and we should trust that Jesus can heal uh, in that way. Now, these are several ways that we can apply the belief about physical healing in our lives. Let leaders pray. Each of us pray together. Lay hands on one another. Look for someone that has the gift of healing and pray for healing in that way. Now, as the people of God, we want to put our faith and our trust in God for everything. That's just true. We know that to be true that we put our faith and trust in God for everything in our lives. And this includes physical healing. As difficult or as challenging as it may be throughout our lifetime, we're called to put our trust in the Lord. Now, you may have noticed that over the past several months, we've had people up front right here at Cheney Faith Center, and we talk about it often at the end of our messages that somebody is here to pray with you if you'd like to pray. Now, one of our hopes in starting this and having someone to pray for us after services every single Sunday is that we would put our hope and our trust and our faith in Jesus and that we would agree in prayer together whenever you need something in your life. And that may include physical healing. And so whenever you need physical healing, our hope as a church is that you would take the time to come up after church is dismissed, and just get prayer. That we would begin to be a church that says, we're gonna believe by faith that God can do anything. And I mean anything, like if you need physical healing, I'm gonna trust that by faith, you're going to, instead of leave on Sunday morning, you're gonna come up and pray for someone. Just like in any other instance in your life. If you need a new job, you would say, man, I really need a new job. I, I, I can't find one and it's difficult. I'm gonna go up and pray, for that, pray with that person. I'm gonna ask him to pray for me to get a new job. Whatever it might be, we're gonna trust the Lord for that situation. You might come forward and say, I, I need some help at work. I, I'm, I'm struggling as a parent. Uh, whatever it is, I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna believe by faith that Jesus can answer my prayer that if I take time to, to, by faith, instead of leaving, come up and pray, that I'm going to trust that God can do something in my life today. And I want to continue for us to, to stand in that place of faith in Jesus. One of the things that I know um, that I feel like prayer does in my life, even if my prayer is not answered exactly in the way that I want it to be answered. I feel like the more I pray about it, the closer I am to Jesus in it. The closer I am to Jesus in the middle of that challenge of something getting answered or not answered. If I choose to not pray about it ever, then I know I always end up just kind of reserved and far away from God. And if I never talk to God in the middle of it, and I never talk to God in the middle of my struggle in it, then I just find myself getting more and more distant from him. And I find myself being tempted to lose faith in Christ completely and totally. But as I press into God, even when he doesn't answer my prayer, I find myself in this place where I'm much closer to God and he's revealing himself to me in a much deeper way. And I, I discover that the greatest part of my life is being close to God and being in his presence and being in his grace especially when he doesn't answer my prayer. And that becomes uh, a very, very important part of our life and our concept and our relationship with God as well. But let's choose as a church to be a church that believes that Jesus can heal today and that by faith he can heal and will heal. We want to be that kind of people. We want to be people that believe for that healing because We want Jesus to be glorified in our lives. We want Jesus to be glorified in our generation. 
We want Jesus to be seen by the people in our city and our state. And we also want our own lives to be touched by the Almighty God. And so those are things and reasons that we want to see healing today. And that I believe we should continue to believe for healing today and have faith for healing today because of who Jesus is and who Jesus calls us to be. So would you stand with me this morning? And we're going to conclude with just, I just would like us to pray for, for this for a moment and just pray kind of begin to process it and contemplate it in our life. I'm going to ask our prayer partners to come forward as we pray. Because I want us to just be ready to have people pray for us if we would like to come forward for whatever we need prayer for. And it could be anything. It could be physical healing, but it could be anything in particular. But um, could we just take a moment and just present ourselves to the Lord because I know this is a challenging subject and I know it's a challenging thing in our lives and I know that there are times that we've had to really walk through very difficult seasons of trusting the Lord. And if you've gone through a season like that um, of trusting the Lord in a very deep and a passionate way, then um, you know exactly what we're talking about as you wrestle with this theologically as you wrestle with it practically, and as you wrestle with having faith in Jesus and trusting in him in the middle of a very difficult season. So could we just take a moment and do that and just present our hearts to the Lord? Jesus, we thank you that you never leave us and you never forsake us, no matter what. Whether we're healed or not, one of the things that we are absolutely 100% positive of is that you are there. And there are times that you heal and it's awesome and it's great, but there are times that you carry us through something and we are not healed. And our physical body still is working on something. In those moments, Jesus, I pray that we would, we would discover a deeper faith a stronger faith, a more genuine faith. And I pray like the Apostle Paul, Lord, that those that are still struggling with the theology of this, or even practically you might be struggling with it right now, would you know that God's grace is sufficient for you? That God's grace is with you? that God's grace was with you, is with you, and will always be with you. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus, we're also reminded, and we're so thankful, that while we live in a human body that you, you call a tent, that one day we will receive a heavenly body. That when we get to heaven, There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more sorrow. That we won't even have to talk about healing anymore because our body will never need to be healed. It will never be sick. It will never have disease. It will never experience death. Thank you, Jesus, that that's who you are and that's why you went to the cross and that's what you paid for. Jesus, we also want to be people that believe in you by faith. Help us to be people that do. Help us to be people that believe in you by faith even when we don't see what we want to see. And I think that that's happening everywhere around us right now, Lord Jesus, in so many different areas of our life. We look around our world today and there's so many ways that you are not being glorified. And we have to choose to trust you. We have to choose to believe in you. We have to choose to have faith in you while everything around us is telling us not to. So Jesus, help us not to lose faith in you. Help us to continue to believe in you in a very strong way, even when things aren't exactly like we want it to be.
Jesus, I, I wanna pray right now as well for those that maybe are in the room that do need some, a healing of some kind, physical or emotional or mental or spiritual, whatever it may be. Lord, as we close our time together, I wanna pray for those in the room that they would, they would stick around and they would choose by faith to not leave this room, but to come forward and pray with a prayer partner, to be anointed with oil, to believe for healing, and to trust that if that's what you're gonna do, you can. And so Lord, help us to be a church that believes for that. Help us to be a church that continues to see the miraculous like we did a month ago when a woman was healed in our church. Help us to continue to see that, Jesus, because we want you to be glorified. We want you to be praised. And so, Jesus, we leave this place. We leave this time having faith in you. Help our trust to be richer and deeper in you. And help us to believe that you can heal today. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So as I dismiss this this morning, if that's you and you just feel like, yeah, I, need, I have something I want to pray about. And whatever that is, uh, I, I'm just going to encourage you, don't leave yet. Just hang out and come up and find someone to pray, for, pray with and, and let us just wrestle with something together in prayer. Amen? Well, thanks for being in church this morning. Always remember, Jesus loves you very much. So to Kate and I, have a great week.